The Poison IV Remote Access Toolkit has actually been around since about 2005. It's been used in a number of uh, prominent attacks. For example, the Nitro Gang actually has used uh, this particular toolkit. And I did some videos on some of the activities of the Nitro Gang, specifically their exploitation of vulnerabilities affecting both Java and Internet Explorer. Uh, but in general, I want to point out that activity, a real active development of Poison Ivy stopped in 2008. Uh, so it's a fairly old threat. It's a long time ago that it really stopped being worked on, but yet we continue to see Poison Ivy being used in many attacks. Uh, so as you can imagine, given that development stopped so long ago, it's not a very sophisticated threat, especially by today's standards, but I think its popularity has really been fueled in large part by factors like its ease of use and its ease of accessibility. Now, Poison IV functions as a remote access tool. It's really more of a toolkit that leads to a remote access tool, which means that once it's installed onto a system, the attacker essentially gets uh, carte blanche access to that system to do whatever he or she desires. Uh, the carte blanche access would include capabilities like the ones I've listed here on the screen. For example, being able to take screenshots of the victim's system, uh, being able to record uh, the victim's keystrokes, being able to retrieve files from the victim system and to modify those files as well, uh, being able to modify the Windows registry, being able to spawn remote shells to see what processes are running on the system, kill any active processes, um, and kill any network connections, control and view services, see what's installed in the system, and, and so on and so forth. So really, this is just an incredible list of capabilities that are provided with this one particular type of attack tool. Now, there are some other remote access tools out there that have been used by attackers. Uh, examples of such tools include things like uh, Dark Comet. That's one example of a remote access tool. Uh, another example of a remote access tool is Shady Rat. Uh, and, and there are a whole bunch of others as well, but I won't go into all of them in this particular video. But you might be wondering maybe at this point, uh, what actually distinguishes a remote access tool from some other type of malware that ostensibly does something similar? Uh, in other words, you know, why do we have this, this new nomenclature to describe something that might already exist? So first of all, let me uh, contrast a remote access tool with another type of tool known as an info stealer. Uh, you may have heard this term info stealer before. And basically info stealers are, are Trojans that, ref that really just steal information from a system. Now the difference between an info stealer and a remote access tool is that info stealers are largely uh, passive, uh, which means that the attacker basically installs it, they sit back, and it steals information that is sent back to the attacker. Now in contrast, a remote access tool is, is not actually passive, it's a much more active tool. The attacker will actually actively probe and work with the remote access tool. They'll think about what they actually want, uh, when they want it in real time, they'll be actively engaging with the system that they've compromised. And so in that sense, uh, info stealers are passive, but remote access tools are either active, or maybe a better term for that is they're more interactive from the purview of the attacker. So as you can imagine, the presence of a remote access tool is indicative of a more uh, targeted attack in an environment because the attackers may be going after something specific uh, versus doing any kind of run-of-the-mill uh, cybercrime. So typically when you see a targeted attack, that is maybe more of a sign of corporate espionage being the underlying motive behind the attack. Remote access tools are also distinct from backdoors. This is maybe another term that you've probably heard in the past. And backdoors are basically uh, designed to just primarily give you backdoor capabilities. And while remote access trojans also have backdoor capabilities, they actually couple those capabilities, uh, they add to those capabilities also a graphical user interface or a GUI. So the idea is that the presence of the interface makes it much easier for an attacker to carry out uh, whatever nefarious actions they wish to carry out. And actually, I think this last point is particularly worth noting. One of the challenges that exists in being able to detect a threat posed by a remote access tool is that you have to separate the functionality of that tool, you know, what it actually does uh, from the underlying intent of the tool. In other words, why it actually does it, why is this functionality and how is it being leveraged 
uh, in whatever capacity that it's being leveraged. What, what's the intent behind how that functionality is used? And there are legitimate reasons for permitting a remote party to have access to your system. For example, IT administrators in large companies and large organizations will often want to remotely administer a system so that they can troubleshoot issues and maybe generally provide some degree of support. So remote access functionality in and of itself is not inherently malicious. However, that functionality when placed in the hands of somebody with malicious intent can definitely cause a lot of issues, it can cause a lot of harm. And while we can observe the actions on a system, it's not always possible to readily ascertain the intent behind those actions.